Hi everyone. I wanted to quickly review some of the main points from today's lecture uh, in preparation for the exam coming up on Tuesday. First of all, we talked a little bit about synapses again, in this case synapses in the central nervous system, um, and in particular synapses that release glutamate. Um, they're very similar to the ones in the neuromuscular junction in that they're vesicles filled with no transmitter. It's glutamate instead of acetylcholine. When an action pinch arrives, calcium comes in and that triggers the vesicle to release its neurotransmitter into the synapse. It's eventually going to be taken back up by the presynaptic cell, but uh, in the few milliseconds that the neurotransmitter is in the synapse, it's going to stick to the postsynaptic receptors. Glutamate typically binds to ionotropic receptors, that is ligand-gated ion channels, which should be called glutamate receptors, but instead are called AMPA receptors. For this class period, we talked about obsessive compulsive disorder and a variety of studies that looked at axons from the orbital frontal cortex into the striatum where they make contact with dendrites of cells that live in the striatum. These synapses themselves are also in the striatum. In the first study that we talked about, um, we finished up with the uh, paper on SAPAP3 mice. The final question that they asked is, how do synapses differ in the SAPAP3 mice versus the wild type control? By SAPAP3 mice, I mean mice that are lacking the SAPAP3 gene. So that mice that have no SAPAP3 versus mice that do. So control mice wild type do, the SAPAP3 mice or SAPAP3 knockout mice, to be more explicit, lack the SAPAP3 gene. The first figure from that paper shows, or rather the first panel of the figure that I showed, um, shows that the synapses are weaker. So when you stimulate the orbital frontal cortex once, you get a weaker response. There are two possible explanations for that. Either there could be fewer glutamate receptors, or there could be fewer calcium receptors. In the case of fewer glutamate receptors, we would expect the um, presynaptic dy dynamics, the change in release, to be the same, meaning that if it's half as big on the first pulse, it's going to be the second pulse is also going to be half as big as the wild type. Um, that's because the ratio of these things is determined by the um, relative amount of neurotransmitter released on the first versus second pulse. There are a variety of different factors that play into that, but the bottom line is if there are fewer calcium channels, then we will see fewer vesicles released the first time, and then a, per, and then a larger ratio, or at least a different ratio, um, between the first and second pulse. Conversely, if the change is postsynaptic in the number of AMPA receptors over here, then the presynaptic terminal is still going to release the same um, uh, amount the first time and release twice as much, in this case, the second time. When they did the experiment, they found that the ratio of the two is the same. Um, this is also encapsulated in this summary here um, about why, the, why they are smaller, the manipulation involving a pair of pulses, looking at this paired pulse ratio as a measurement, observing the same ratio, and then concluding no change in presynaptic terminal, and therefore, by process of elimination, the weakness must be because of fewer receptors. The next thing that we talked about was um, the Suzanne Amari and Anne Graybeal papers. In both of those papers, they're interested in understanding the role of the orbital frontal cortex to um, striatum in uh, obsessive compulsive disorder like behaviors. In the Anne Graybeal paper, they had they inserted channel rhodopsin in the orbital frontal cortex. They trained had both wild type mice and SAPAP3 knockout mice. Both sets were trained so that a bell means water drops. And then they tried to untrain the mice. Um, what they found, their measurement is just measuring how much the mice wipe when the bell arrives versus how much they wait for the water before they start to wipe. The result is that the knockout mice, first of all, wipe more. That's not one that I show, but that is a result um, in response to the bell. 
But then the interesting thing that they did is when they tried to untrain the mice about the, um, so, so they made it so that the bell very rarely signaled um, a water drop. What they found is that the wild type mice quickly unlearned, again, something that I didn't show but was in the paper. The knockout mice, however, do not unlearn. The main figure that I showed up there um, was looking at the knockout mice and showing that these knockout mice are still wiping in response to the bell, even when the water is coming very infrequently. The critical experiment that they did in this paper was to ask what happens when we activate the orbital frontal cortex synapses into the striatum. To do that, they had modified the orbital frontal cortex neurons to have this channel rhodopsin, this light activated sodium channel that will make them activate when you shine light on them. Um, and so the fact that the light's blue doesn't matter. It, I mean, it matters, but it's sort of like just, we're st the, the critical thing is that we're stimulating the orbital frontal cortex inputs. What Anne Grabiel found is that in these mice, who are, who are compulsively grooming in response to the bell, when they shine the blue light on, they stop grooming in response to the bell and only groom if water drops short up. The conclusion from this is that probably these orbital frontal cortex synapses are too weak. That ties nicely back into the earlier picture we were talking about. And that stimulating the orbital frontal cortex seems to fix these OCD-like symptoms. The last paper that we talked about was Susanna Mari's paper. Um, the question is pretty much the same. What is the role of these connections from the orbital frontal cortex to the striatum in terms of obsessive compulsive disorder? Um, one similarity is that there are mice that have channel rhodopsin in the orbital frontal cortex neurons that project to the striatum. A key difference, or one of the first differences, is that all of the mice are wild type mice. There are no SAPAP3 mutant mice. We're starting with healthy animals. Also, differently, they're measuring spontaneous grooming behavior. They're not training the mice anything about a bell or anything like that. What they found, the, manip the, the, the further manipulation is to, for several hours, over many days, they repeatedly activated the orbital frontal cortex to striatum synapse. What they found is that after many days of continuously activating this, then if they just watch the mice when they are when the when the researchers are not stimulating this, the mice are spontaneously grooming excessively. So the conclusion is that activating this orbital frontal cortex to striatum is bad. Doing it too much causes OCD. A more nuanced conclusion, um, or a more and perhaps a little bit more speculative is that perhaps this repeated activation causes the synapses to get rid of That reconciles a little bit more with the other results. There are a lot of open things that haven't been done. For example, in these mice here, in Susanna Mari's paper, which have had, mo if, we, if we take more mice like this, healthy mice, overstimulate this connection, does the grooming stop momentarily if we turn back on our, our um, orbital frontal cortex inputs? Um, also, what happens to trained grooming if we have these mice here? So there are a lot of unreconcilable, unreconciled differences that could be reconciled with further experiments. And in fact, ongoing work is attempting to reconcile these things.